Daniel chapter 10, verses 1 through 9. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. And the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen, with a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thanks, Amy. Welcome to those of you who are at home. Uh, welcome, Harvest, for those who are here. As we jump into this text, <clears throat> there's a story I'm reminded of. A woman recounted a story from her childhood made memorable by the distress uh, that she heard in her father's voice that she didn't fully understand. It was in the days before cell phones and before many phones had phone extensions that could be in other parts of the house. Telephones were often in the central hall or kitchen so that family members could run and catch the phone when it was ringing. I know that's kind of hard for some of us to believe, particularly the youngers, but this was the context of where where the phone was. So this particular evening, the children had gone to bed. Everyone was in their room except this girl's father. He stood in the dark, in the hallway, on the phone, talking to her older brother who was long distance in Vietnam. The brother was scared. He had seen things that had enraged and confused him. Now his dad was half a world away in the dark of his house, listening to his son's angst. What could he say to his son in the midst of a war to bring him comfort and enable him to keep functioning as he must? The girl says her father would simply wait for his son to pause in the gush of complaint and confusion and fear. And then he would say, I love you, David. Another few minutes would pass and the father would say, I love you, David. Then another few minutes and another, I love you, David. The father simply affirmed his love for his son during a time of war. And the woman remembers that night with vivid clarity all these years later, not just because she knew that something was very wrong with her brother, but also because she learned how powerful and necessary it was to affirm a father's love in a time of crisis. Crisis never comes at a time when we expect. In fact, it probably wouldn't feel like a crisis or we might not call it a crisis if it came when we expected it or could prepare for it. So what do we do when crisis strikes? What promises do we hold on to in those circumstances? Well, as we come to Daniel chapter 10, we find Daniel in a time of crisis. Remember, he's likely in his 90s at this point in time. His people had been in captivity for 70 years. And Daniel finds himself in a place of weakness. And so we're going to look at two promises that Daniel is presented with in the midst of weakness through an experience that he has. So the first 
One is this, God meets us in the midst of our weakness. Because Daniel, as we come to this passage, he sees a vision and it makes him weak. He's burdened by a vision that he has about the future. Look at verse one. So it says, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar, and the word was true, and it was a great conflict. Daniel sees a great conflict in this vision that's going to be coming in the future. Now, we'll talk more about that next week as we get into the next chapter, but the conflict is so great. The vision that he sees is so great. This is what happens to him in verse two. He's mourning for three weeks. I know there are times when maybe I have a dream that wakes me up in the middle of the night and I can't go back to sleep. Or there are times when uh, there are trials going on in my life where, you know, I might not sleep as well for a certain period of time, but I can't recall a time where I would have seen a vision and then mourned for three weeks, changed my diet. Like, that's the context that what he saw was so great that it caused him to be burdened. The future that he saw caused him to be burdened. As he looked into the future, future generations of his people were going to be at war. There was going to be more suffering. Not just, we've, we've been here 70 years and there's the hope that we're going to go back to our land and everything's going to be fine. No, it wasn't going to end. It's like, well, Things should be getting better, right? Things should be getting better, but why does it seem like things are going to get worse? They're going to get a lot worse. I don't know if you've experienced that. When it seems like whatever you do, there there are just additional trials that just seem to come, more waves of trials. You can't seem to catch a break. That's what it feels like for Daniel in this place as he's burdened about the future and he's weak. He's also weak because he is left behind. Look at verse 7. It says, And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled and hid themselves. Daniel is left alone. He has a vision, and And he's left alone. I don't know the dynamics of it, but maybe maybe you've encountered that reality where there's some burden that has come to your doorstep, and every as you share that burden with others, rather than expecting them to respond and embrace you or comfort you, they seem to distance themselves from you. That's the context of what's happened. Daniel's left alone. Have you ever tried to explain your pain? And the more that you explain, the more maybe someone is backing away and spends less time with you and you feel more alone than you were before. That's what what Daniel's experiencing in this moment. But there's even more in the context of the passage that we can actually glean from verse 1. Because in verse 1, it says, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. The significance of that name is important because Cyrus, is he's another king, a new king, that Daniel is other, but something is underneath. But something profound happens under the king of Cyrus. So put your hand in your Bible here and flip back in your Bibles to the book of Ezra. It's after... You know, first and second Chronicles is the book of Ezra, and I'm just going to read verses one to three. So this is what happens in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it 
in writing. So this is the first year. This stirring that happens in the book of Ezra happens in the first year of Cyrus, and the vision that Daniel is having is in the third year, okay? So this news that comes is happening two years earlier. But this is what what happens. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has changed yeah, he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. So two years ago, this happens to the king that Daniel is serving under. The 70 years have come to completion. Like, this is happening. This is Jerusalem. We're going to build the temple. Remember Daniel, when he was praying before he got thrown into the lion's den, where was the direction of his prayer? The direction was toward Jerusalem because his desire was that the temple would be rebuilt and the people of God would go back to the people, the place where God met with his people. He was longing for that day. And people, I mean, we, we read it. Go. The, the people of God, this is your God. You go to the place. But Daniel hasn't gone. Daniel hasn't gone to the place that he's been longing to go. And you wouldn't necessarily know by first reading, but this likely happened around the time of the Passover. The Passover is when the people of God would have a meal to be reminded of how God protected his people and passed over them. Remember in the Old Testament where they sacrificed the the lamb and they put the blood on the doorposts and God passed over them. God went and killed the firstborn son in all the houses in Egypt, but he didn't in the people of God because he passed over them. So they were going to celebrate that. And Daniel would have wanted to be celebrating that. And he's not in the place that he'd been longing to be. So he, he not only has these others that leave, him, that, that leave him in the midst of seeing this vision, others are going. Over the last two years, he may have seen people that he had known people that had been born and raised in the time that he was in exile and he sees them go and he's left behind. Do you ever feel left behind? Like others are moving forward, they're moving on in their journey, they're moving on and, and you just seem to be watching them go by. That's where Daniel was. It says in verse 8, so I was left alone and saw this great vision and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed and I retained no strength. Have you experienced this kind of weakness? Where where it seems like the life that you have, the vibrant life that you have just gets sucked out of you? I know a friend of mine described for me the season of time that she experienced after she got divorced. She unfortunately had a husband who walked away from Jesus and then walked away from their marriage and their children. And when she would get up in the morning, she would literally roll out of bed on the floor and couldn't get up. Just the simple act of getting up to go put some cold water on her face, brush her teeth, was everything that she could do. Maybe you've not had her particular trial, but maybe you've experienced that in your life before. So Daniel is overwhelmed by the trial, overwhelmed by being left alone, but he's overwhelmed by one more thing. 
And Daniel, because Daniel was in the presence of a divine messenger. Look at verse 5. Here's the description. I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around the waist. Not, not, not fake gold, not something that looks like gold uh, of gold. And his body was like barrel. What is barrel? Barrel is kind of a classification for gems, for some precious stones. And he goes on in the description, and throughout the description, he's like, it's like this. Because he doesn't have a clear picture of like, there's nothing in this world that can really describe the image of this being that's in front of me, but I'm going to just kind of throw out some things that can kind of help you to understand what I'm seeing, but nobody else is seeing it. And he's like, well, it's like Beryl. His body is like precious jewels. His face like the appearance of lightning. You know how lightning, if you look at lightning, and it kind of, kind of blinding. It's, it kind of, kind of scares you when it happens, particularly if it strikes right near where you are. His eyes like flaming torches. His arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze. So there's a glow about him, a shining about him, the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. So he's burdened about the future. He's left alone, but he's in the presence of greatness. He's in the presence of one that is not like him. And he's aware of that difference, and it leaves him with no strength. He retains no strength. When we find ourselves in the presence of true greatness, it's going to have that same effect on us. Because this image actually points us to a more significant image. Though this angelic being is coming and interacting with Daniel, it's pointing to another in the book of Revelation. If you were to turn to the book of Revelation in verse uh, chapter 1, verses 13 to 16, this is what we read. It says, In the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest, the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. That's a description of Jesus Christ. That's a description of the risen Christ who is coming. He is coming again. And when we encounter the risen Christ for who he is, Jesus isn't some guy that just wore a robe and walked around hugging trees and just being nice. Jesus is the strong son of God. And when we encounter him, we, we buckle at the knees. And I would encourage you to, to consider Christ for who he is, not some image that you may have seen in a poorly drawn kid's Bible somewhere. Consider Christ for who he is and humble yourself before him because there's a day when everyone will stand before him and we won't be able to stand because the Bible says that every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord. Why? Because when you're in a presence of a being like this, there's not any options. You're going to be undone. The, the knees that you have, no matter how strong you think they are, they're not going to work. So we need to respond to Christ. But this messenger, this messenger doesn't leave 
Daniel in his weakness. Certainly, we need to repent and believe and come to Christ now. Don't wait for that day. But for those of us who have trusted in Christ, when we find ourselves in a place of weakness, when we find ourselves abandoned, when we feel like, okay, we we see Christ and we feel like, well, maybe I'm experiencing these things because of the things that I've done. I mean, I look at my life and I've made mistakes and I've struggled and I've fallen short and maybe I'm just feeling these consequences and and we can start to back up and we don't want to engage with Jesus. We don't want to run to the cross because we're just aware of our sinfulness in light of his holiness. But the angel shows us a picture. The divine messenger touches him because after he falls on his face in a deep sleep on the ground, undone, look at verse 10, and behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. Daniel is so undone that he's prostrate on the ground, but he's touched by an angelic messenger and he's lifted up. God meets us in our weakness. When we need a touch from God, when we can't lift ourselves up, when we find ourselves in that difficult place, God comes and he meets us. We don't even have to have him come meet us to get us moving forward. Sometimes we just need to be lifted up off the ground, get on our hands and knees, and Christ is there for you because God meets you in your weakness. So if you have trusted in Christ and you find yourself in his presence, you find yourself all alone, you need to come to him, you need to run to him, Because here's the reality. Even though I say you're going to run to him, that's more about fixing your gaze. That's not about moving Jesus because he's come to you. As we heard the story, as we anticipate, you know, in this Advent season, we anticipate celebrating the coming of Christ. We do that for a purpose because Christ has come. He has come near. He has come in the flesh. He has gone to the cross for our sins. And he sent his Holy Spirit to dwell in us, to be with us so that you can be reminded that you aren't alone. So that in the midst of your weakness, you can know you're not alone. Because he meets us in the midst of our weakness. The second promise is God brings peace in the midst of our peril, in the midst of our trial, in the midst of our struggle. He brings peace. So how do we get the peace? How do we get peace in the midst of our trials? We need to have the assurance of promises. Promises of God's character, promises that God has made for us. So here's some assurances of God's promises that Daniel gets. He he gets the assurance of God's love. Take a look at verse 11. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. So he wants to continue to get up. You are loved. He wants him to know, you are loved, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. So he goes from being prostrate, like dead. He gets up his hands and knees. The angel's like, no, I know that you are loved. He was able to stand because of the assurance of God's love. As we talked about earlier at the beginning, as he described the woman who was a little girl that listened from her bedroom as her father took the phone call of fear and frustration and rage from his son who was engaged in a war that seemed so futile. She recounts that the long listening silence would be broken only as her dad responded with those few words repeated as pauses would come. I love you, David. I love you, David. I love you, David. He would repeat again and again. These words in the darkness of the night across thousands of miles to a battlefield in Vietnam were sent to touch a heart with love so that it might find peace and through peace find strength to face another day. 
The young girl for whom the words were not meant, but who listened, said the words touched her and became the gospel to her own heart for many years to come. She believed in a God who, like her father, would speak to those in a battle-weary world with words as simple as, yes, it's true, and it's awful, but I love you, and I will redeem you. I will redeem you from it all so that you can have peace to face it today with strength for my purposes. Friends, we've heard this message. We're going to hear this message again and again and again, that your God loves you. You need to look no further than the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ to know the the lengths at which he has gone to express his love for you. After we're done with the being in the word this morning, we're going to have communion together so that we can be reminded again of what Christ has done, reminded of what the Father has done. You need to know the Father loves you. Have the assurance of God's love. Have the assurance that your prayers are heard. So Daniel had the assurance that God hears his prayers. Look at verse 12. He said to me, fear not, Daniel, From the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, your words have been heard. I have come because of your words. Your words have been heard. This angelic being has been sent because Daniel prayed. His words were heard. Your words are heard. Again, we've heard this message already in the book of Daniel. We've heard this truth, but we need to hear it again. When you go to pray, your words are heard because of what Christ has done. A friend described for me a phone call that he had with one of his children. One of his children called him when they were in a time of great trial and distress. They didn't didn't know what to do. They were in the place. And when he got on the phone and he called and they heard his voice, he could tangibly, he could tangibly hear on the other end of the line that they had a measure of peace. Why did they have a measure of peace? Not because the dad could make the thing go away like that. But they knew that they had been heard. They knew that they had been heard by someone who could do something about their situation. Even if the the thing they needed done wasn't done in that very moment. They knew that they'd been heard. They knew that he could do something about it. So when you go and you pray and you seek the Lord, know that you're heard because, and know that he can do something about it. Certainly you can ask. There are times when he answers immediately right away and he does, but even if he doesn't answer right away, you can have comfort and peace knowing that you've been heard. And he's got a host of angels to be sent out to do the work that needs to be done. Because peace came in that child's situation, not because there was an immediate answer, because they reached out to someone they knew could help. So you are heard when you pray. Have that assurance and be assured of his presence. Be assured of God's presence in verse 12. It says, fear not. Fear not. And I have come because of your words. I've come because I have heard your words. Again, we are celebrating Advent. We are looking towards that. Why? Because it says in John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is that the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He's come. He has come near. He has sent his Holy Spirit. If you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are praying about this before church in the prayer meeting. You've been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Whenever you feel conviction of sin or a measure of comfort, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you and reminding you that God is near. So have the assurance of his presence. 
Fourthly, have the assurance of an advocate. That advocate is one that pleads a case for another. Also can be someone who defends and someone who supports. And that happens to Daniel. He, he learns he has an advocate as he is in the midst of this trial of himself. God brings peace because he realized he's got an advocate who defends him because there are spiritual battles being fought. Take a look at verse 13. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the king of Persia. What's going on there? You, who, are, who are these people? Like, as he's interacting, these aren't, these aren't warriors from Israel. These aren't people from some other nation. These aren't Goliath fighters. These, these are beings that we don't see with our eyes. And he's, he's giving a picture to Daniel of something that's going on. This great angelic representative of God was delayed for a few weeks in his coming because he's wrestling with this being and maybe his minions called the Prince of Persia. And they called another angel along, uh, Michael, to help him. Now, there's a lot of questions. I don't know about you, but when I read that, every time I read it, I'm like, I got a lot of questions. Like, what did that look like? How big are they? What are they doing? What are the orders? Are they following it? Like, how come, how come, they, how come it took them so long? Like, why didn't they just like, pfft, they're done and they move right along? Like, I want, I want to know more stuff but it's okay that we don't know more stuff. But there is stuff that we do know. So rather than spending our time like pontificating and trying to figure out things that we don't know that God hasn't revealed to us, let's focus on the things that he has. There is a spiritual dimension. There's a spiritual realm in which battles are fought. Theologian Abraham Kuyper wrote this. He said, if once the curtains were pulled back, and the spiritual world behind it came into view, it would expose to our spiritual vision a struggle so intense, so convulsive, sweeping everything within its range that the fiercest battle ever fought on earth would seem by comparison a mere game. There's a spiritual realm. This is not the only place we see that. We see it in the New Testament because spiritual battles are real. Peter says, when we studied First Peter, Peter says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Seeking someone to devour. Satan and his minions are real. But we aren't to be paranoid about them. We're not to be like, okay, he's prowling around. Let's go find him. There's some bushes over there. Let's go, let's go look under them because he's probably over there. That's not what the scriptures teach us to do. Jesus didn't go around looking for demons. It tells us to be watchful because spiritual battles are everyday occurrences, not just during times of crisis. Not just during times that Daniel got this particular picture of this battle that was raging on. They, they rage on, and I know you feel it. I know you feel it when you are on social media and your heart tends to go towards the flesh of anxiety or jealousy or other things as you see other people post things, doing things that you're not doing, or you know, that, and there's a tug in your heart that's going, or maybe you're clicking on reading the news and there are images of, of improper uh, uh, things that we shouldn't see, and there's the temptation to go and click on that and click on another thing and click on another thing, and there's the tug of our hearts. Don't think that that's just right here, horizontal. Satan is prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking those to devour. And there's a, there's a battle that's raging 
on and you feel it. Don't ignore it. Be watchful because Paul tells us about it in Ephesians. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We engage in this spiritual battle through prayer. I'm not going to go into a teaching on Ephesians chapter 6 and putting on the whole armor of God, but we could, but it, it's engaged through prayer. Not by putting spreadsheets together in our head and, and trying to figure things out. It's engaged through prayer. We don't do it by pulling up our bootstraps and then muscling these things out. No, we engage through prayer because there's a battle raging on that we're not fighting, that God has someone else fighting for us. And we ask him to move. But also the spiritual realm, though it's real, it's nothing to fear. Because 1 John 4 reminds us of this. He says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So even though these battles rage on, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. We learn from the book of Acts that demons flee simply at the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus. Not because somebody worked it up or like, okay, I got to figure out their name. I got to figure out what their names are because obviously if there's this prince of Persia over Persia, there must be the, the prince of Berrien County. We must, we must figure out what his name is and we got to just name. You know, Daniel wasn't doing that. But there is a spiritual battle going on. And we, we battle it through prayer and we don't need to be afraid because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Demons flee at the name of Jesus and the spirit of God is in you and he's gonna strengthen you in the midst of overwhelming odds because advocates don't just fight the spiritual battles, they, they strengthen you in the midst of overwhelming odds. That's what happens to Daniel. Look at verse 15, he says, when he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. So again, he's, he's overwhelmed again. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. And then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O oh my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me. I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now, no strength remains in me. No breath is left in me. He's aware. He's aware of his weakness. He's aware of sin of his people. He's aware of his own sin. And he's not sure if he wants to come. I mean, as a parent, certainly we want to come and help our children to grow. And there are times we, we know that they're going to make mistakes. And we're going to come to them uh, when, we, when we catch them uh, walking in sin. And we come to them. We want to help them. We want to walk with them. And our kids can kind of back, back away because they've been caught. They've been, they've been caught. They don't, they don't want to face the consequences or the punishment or whatever else is going to come at them. Even if your intention is to come and shower grace upon them, to walk with them, to restore them, they want to be hindered, and that's where Daniel's at. But even though he's in that place, look what the angel does. In verse 18, again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he says, O oh man, greatly loved, fear not. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak for you have strengthened me. He's already told him that he loved him, but he gets weak again. Like this is interaction, just even in that. Maybe you feel that way. You, you get a measure of grace. Like the Lord meets you. You're ready to go do it. As soon as you get up from your prayer time, like something happens and you just feel like you're knocked on your keister once again. Like, ah. Uh, that didn't seem to do anything. 
The Lord's like, oh man, you didn't get it the first time. Sorry. No. The angel reminds him again. You don't need to have your life all cleaned up before you come to Christ. As you come to Christ, you don't need to have it all figured out. If you find yourself slipping and falling into a pattern of sin again, that doesn't mean that you're kind of set aside and he just takes care of the good kids. No, he comes to you, supports you and strengthens you in the midst of overwhelming odds. Sometimes it's of your own doing. Other times it just seems like everything's crashing crashing in around you because you have an advocate. If Jesus would bless a man who confessed in Mark chapter 9, I believe, help my unbelief, then we can come to him when we are drained of strength. Don't worry about carefully crafting your words as, as if you need to say just the right thing for God to hear. Just come to the throne of grace. This is one of his many promises in Isaiah 41. Fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Take that to the bank again and again and again. He's an advocate for you, and he pleads for you, and he's going to fight for you, because that's what happens with Daniel. So this This angelic being had been fighting for him, but then he says this in verse 20. Then he said, do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. So he's going to go back. There's this battle raging on. And there is a battle raging on. If we were to to stop right here and start to study in the book of Ezra as they go back to Jerusalem and as they start to rebuild the temple or even later on when they start to build the wall, there is all kinds of opposition. There's a halting of the building of the temple. There's a need for those that are building the wall to carry swords and have a sword in one hand and build with the other hand. There's, there's a war still going on and opposition happening and God is fighting for his people. He says, but I, when I go, behold, the prince of Greece will come. So there's more that are going to come. But I will tell you that this, what is inscribed in the book of truth, there is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. And Michael's not a small guy, I can assure you of that. The advocate's one who pleads the cause of another, specifically one that pleads the cause of another before a tribunal or a judicial court. And that has happened because Jesus is the one that took the judgment that you deserved. Guilty has been proclaimed. And there's one who took that guilt for you. So when opposition comes, know the Lord's going to fight for you. So many times I try to take things into my own hands, thinking through how do I respond to this or how do I respond to this criticism or how do I justify myself losing sleep, wasting time. When the angel's simply coming and functionally saying to Daniel, I love you, I've responded to your prayers. You need to know that you're loved. I've responded to your prayers. I've come to help you. And I'm going to win. I'm going to win. There's no trepidation in this angel's voice as he goes to the battle again because he's going to win because he's on the side of God. And you, my friend, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you are on the side of God. You are his child and he will fight for you. So he is going to bring peace in the midst of your peril. And closing is a story about Dr. Robert G. Rayburn, the founding president of Covenant Seminary. He related this story. He said, his first combat experience during the Korean War looked like this. He served in the army chaplaincy in World War II, but was recalled from the pastorate for service in the Korean War. Though he already had military experience, his new assignment filled him with 
fear. Chaplain Rayburn was assigned to a unit of army paratroopers. Hey, I know guys who've been paratroopers, and the training that I received in seminary is a bit different than the training that they received, I can assure you. So this is what happened to him. He said, with virtually no training, he was rushed into duty, and Rayburn's first jump was behind enemy lines at night. As the troop plane flew toward the drop site for such a hazardous mission, he noted that men with, a far, more, with far more experience began to tremble. The paratroopers are trembling and breaking out in a cold sweat. He knew that if he fell apart in fright or showed too much terror, he would not be able to minister to the men. So he began to acknowledge his weakness and fear in prayer to God, asking that God would give him peace so that he would be able to fulfill God's purpose in these men's lives. So Rayburn began his prayer as the plane began its two-hour flight to the drop zone in the dark of night. He started by praying for peace of heart, and the next thing he knew The commander was saying, Chaplain, wake up. It's four minutes to the jump. God had answered the prayer for peace and provided him with sleep. In the weeks and months of battle that followed, Dr. Rayburn recorded that he had the opportunity to share his faith with virtually all of the men in that unit, most of whom said, I want the God who gave you such peace that you could sleep before your first jump into battle. Dr. Rayburn prayed to the same God that you pray. He had access because of what Christ has done. And he heard as you should hear, I love you. I've responded to your prayers. I've come to help you, and I will win. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you revealed these promises, not through specific commands as much as the experience that Daniel had as he encountered this dream, as he encountered this angelic being. He encountered promises and truths that we need to hold on to in the midst of everyday life of the challenges that we face. Father, would we be reminded of your love for us? Would we be reminded that you are near? Would we be reminded not only that you can win, but that you have won when Jesus said, it is finished? So Lord, would, uh, would, we, would we delight in these truths? Would we live in the good of these truths? Would we be armed in them, even if we don't find ourselves in the midst of great peril right now? Lord, would these truths be held dear so that we can engage in whatever is coming our way or so that we can come alongside our brothers and sisters in Christ to remind them of these truths as peril comes our way and use us, Lord, as we encounter you and and encounter a peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, would it be a witness to a world that's craving for a peace that eludes them? would it open doors for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.